Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, As always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Got the free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Great study guide, reference resource. Uh, I've pulled out the most important clinical practice pearls, uh, as well as some of the most important uh, educational pearls that you're going to be tested on throughout pharmacology exams, board exams, and things like that. So, Uh, Great resource, great refresher. Go get that for free. Simply an email subscribing to our list. You'll get that uh, and uh, also get updates when we've got new content, new podcasts available. So again, reallifepharmacology.com. All right, let's get into the drug of the day today, and that is desvenlafaxine. Brand name of this medication is Pristique. And the last part of that name may sound a little bit familiar in that venlafaxine I have covered previously. So there's going to be a lot of tie-in and a lot of uh, overlapping coverage here with this medication. Uh, However, dosing is definitely different and and there are a few uh, quirks as far as uh, metabolism and things too. So uh, I'll definitely talk about that uh, later on in the, the podcast there. So it is uh, classified as an antidepressant and, of course, an SNRI. So that's a serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So the use of this medication, uh, where we have uh, some evidence, certainly depression is why it was initially approved by the FDA, uh, but also off-label use you may see uh, is uh, hot flashes, menopausal-type symptoms. Um, with that, I I can say that I have never seen it used, um, for hot flashes, menopause type symptoms personally. Usually, um, you're going to use venlafaxine or uh, definitely there's plenty of other agents too, uh, that I've covered previously for those type of symptoms. And the primary reason being is cost. Uh, generally Pristique is significantly more expensive. Um, and so, you know, down the line of medications, we're going to generally choose to use uh, cheaper medications for uh, depression that are generic and maybe even more experience, um, as well as uh, hot flashes. You're going to use another medication there. Dosing of this medication. So one kind of unique thing, I guess, with this medication is um, initial dosing. So the initial dose of 50 milligrams tends to be therapeutic for patients. Now, I will say some clinicians are going to start certain patients at 25 milligrams just for uh, safety purposes, tolerability purposes. Um, and, And that's, in my opinion, probably the safe route to go unless you really feel like this patient's in urgent need for management of their depression, then you might, um, you know, push it and and go to the 50 milligram dose. Or if they're younger, healthier, we're probably not as concerned uh, about running into adverse effects. Uh, That might be a situation where you go straight to the uh, 50 milligrams, which I believe, don't quote me on that, but I believe it is in the package insert as uh, initial can be uh, 50 milligrams. So elderly, um, patients that, you know, are maybe a little bit more sensitive to adverse effects or they have is- issues with, you know, maybe other antidepressants in the past, that's probably a situation where I would generally recommend starting with the lower dose of 25 milligrams. Uh, now, I would say the generalized max that I have seen uh, in practice is 100 milligrams. Uh, there is potentially Um, Some off-label usages where it might be pushed to to 150 and that being uh, hot flashes, as I I mentioned previously. I've never seen that. I'm probably generally not a huge fan of that. I would be looking at other agents probably uh, for managing menopause and and hot flash type symptoms rather than going that high. Um, But there there may be some evidence and literature out there uh, to support that. All right, let's talk about those adverse drug reactions. So adverse drug reactions, most of these are going to be dose-dependent. Common ones, GI upset, dry mouth, uh, sexual dysfunction can happen, uh, dizziness, 
you know, maybe you can have some insomnia, maybe it can be a little bit more activating for some, some may feel a little bit more fatigued, um, so that kind of uh, waxes and wanes a little bit depending upon the patient. Uh, there is the boxed warning, wanted to mention that particularly in younger patients um, for an increased risk of uh suicidal thoughts, suicidal behaviors, particularly when first starting the medication. So that does apply um, to this uh, antidepressant like virtually all the others as well. So I I didn't want to overlook that. I think I've covered that a little bit more detail in in other uh, SSRI podcasts and and things like that. Okay, so sexual dysfunction, I, I mentioned that's definitely an important thing to think about. Um, in patients that stop taking the medication and it's unclear why, um, this might be a reason uh, that they might not want to tell you that. So that's always a good good one to kind of ask about. SIADH has been reported. Uh, with that, it is important if you're seeing symptoms of hyponatremia, unusual CNS adverse effects, for example, um, definitely check uh, that sodium level and assess the risk of uh, continuing a drug like desvenlafaxine. Uh, elevated blood pressure, uh, that's class. It, that's a class effect, and that, and that certainly can, like many of these are, that is um, a class effect. I, I would say it's not incredibly common, but generally as you get to higher dosages, you may be more and more uh, likely to see that rise in blood pressure. And then withdrawal syndrome, uh, with the SNRIs and any, you know, antidepressant, there is potential there. Um, so if that drug is abruptly discontinued, particularly at higher dosages, like 100 milligrams, for example, um, we certainly could see uh, the withdrawal sy- syndrome and tying that into the pharmacokinetics of the drug, the half-life of this drug isn't crazy long by any means. It's, I think, 10 to 11 hours in that ballpark in normal uh, patients. So with that being said, if you abruptly pull that drug away, your body's going to clear that drug fairly quickly, and it's going to increase the risk of withdrawal syndrome. So again, longer the half-life of a drug, uh, the more it gets to basically having a a self-tapering type effect. And again, with desvenlafaxine having a shorter half-life, that withdrawal syndrome is definitely a real possibility uh, if we abruptly stop that drug. So again, that goes for patients that, um, you know, maybe they're on vacation and they go three, five, seven days without the medication, they could start running into some of those withdrawal syndrome type symptoms. And generally those are anxiety, headache, uh, can have some, some nausea and stomach upset, Uh, And then some CNS changes, dizziness as well. So those are generally the most common ones I've seen in practice when you abruptly uh, stop uh, a drug like uh, venlafaxine here. Uh, Other pharmacokinetic pearls um, for desvenlafaxine. So it is metabolized to a minor extent by CYP3A4. Um, but honestly, excretion is really important. So it's eliminated through the kidney. So in most younger, healthier patients, you're not going to have any issues uh, with elimination. However, as patients age, kidney function tends to decline. Uh, In a good way, I remember this drug uh, and the, the dosing is once you hit less than 50 mils per minute, uh, the maximum generally allowed or the max dose you recommended uh, is 50 milligrams per day. So 50 and 50. So once you kind of cross that 50 mils per minute uh, threshold, uh, we definitely better start thinking about uh, reducing maybe that 100 milligram dose. And then when you get to less than 30 mils per minute, uh, it's recommended to uh, drop that dose down further. So uh, definitely, big picture, definitely remember uh, renal function with desvenlafaxine, which is definitely different from a lot of antidepressants. Uh, many are metabolized via various uh, CYP enzymes, 2D6, 3A4, uh, so on and, and so forth. So again, that CYP 3A4 to a minor extent, does that have you know an impact as far as drug interactions go? 
Uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that um, after the break here. One last thing I wanted to mention, um, just kind of a a unique nugget with the medication regarding uh, pharmacokinetics and absorption and drug concentrations. Uh, Females, women, actually have a 25% higher uh, max concentration. So for a given dose, so if you get 50 milligrams, women are actually going to have a 25% higher uh, peak concentration. Okay, so that's kind of a unique thing. So in my mind, uh, that makes me think that women might be a little bit more at risk for adverse effects if we're getting a higher uh, peak concentration. So just something to look out for there in your uh, female patients. Uh, lastly, I wanted to mention monitoring here, um, blood pressure, heart rate. I, I, I don't put a, a great emphasis on it, but certainly um, we're probably uh, using this medication in, in patients that are on other medications. They're coming into the clinic. They're getting these things checked. Um, so it's like you're, you're getting blood pressure and, and heart rate generally anyway. Um, but obviously, if that heart rate, blood pressure are escalating quickly, you know, desvenlafaxine uh, to a small extent certainly could exacerbate that or worsen that. Um, again, not crazy high on my radar list, but it is something that, that definitely has been reported and particularly at higher dosages. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like NAPLEX, BCPS, ambulatory care, and many more, Go check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. We've got a growing list of resources there. We update content annually, uh, and we've helped hundreds of pharmacists, maybe even to the thousands of pharmacists now, um, pass their board exams. These are difficult exams, uh, pretty low pass rates, particularly with pharmacist board certification. Uh, So go check that out. Support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store, and definitely get some good help trying to help pass those exams. All right, so let's wrap up here with drug interactions. Being an SNRI, I obviously think about serotonin activity. So your uh, Zofrans, your Tramadols, your uh, Linazolid, which Linazolid is an absolute contraindication, um, and that's due to MAOI-type activity. Uh, Cyclobenzaprine has some serotonergic activity. Obviously, any SSRI is going to have that as well, and uh, we definitely want to try to avoid using an SNRI with an SSRI. Uh, Next, antiplatelet activity does come up. Uh, If you go search drug interactions, I don't worry about it a great deal. Uh, I'm generally more focused on um, NSAIDs, uh, obviously anticoagulant medications, antiplatelet medications like aspirin. Um, so I, I keep it on my radar. Uh, I, it's not a absolute contraindication or anything, um, but it is something to, to kind of think about if patients are, uh, having significant, uh, bleed risks and things like that. Uh, elevated blood pressure. So we could have some additive effects there. So think about, you know, stimulants, uh, Sudafed, things like those, um, drugs can increase blood pressure, Uh, Hopefully, we're going to be monitoring blood pressure in our patients like we normally do for uh, anybody, Uh, but certainly uh, an SNRI, particularly at higher dosages, um, can certainly contribute to that. And then, of course, we've got to remember uh, patients on blood pressure medications, we could oppose the potential beneficial effects um, if desvenlafaxine raises blood pressure a little bit there. Now, CYP304, I mentioned a little bit, um, it is a minor pathway of breakdown and deactivation of desvenlafaxine. Uh, so CYP304 inhibitors, inducers, potentially in theory have a small potential to you know, change, alter the concentrations and the activity of the drug. But in my opinion, it's, it's and, and looking at the, the literature and the data, it's probably not going to be to a significant extent. Um, with that said, there could be rare cases uh, where that, that could impact. Um, but with desvenlafaxine, 
um, my money is going to be on that renal function because a significant percentage of that drug is eliminated unchanged in the urine. So grand scheme of things, I'd pay more attention to renal function than I would to CYP3A4 interactions, but there is a potential that both could possibly affect them a little bit there. All right, well, that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. As a reminder, I have all these listed at reallifepharmacology.com, and I've also, if you look on the right-hand side uh, of the podcast page, I've got them categorized out, cardiovascular, neurology, uh, psych, so on and so forth. So I try to categorize these drugs as best I can. So if you're going through school and you're in a specific section on psych or cardio or whatever, um, you can go online, uh, go check them out. They are categorized certainly and uh, certainly help you study, prepare, whether you're, you know, cleaning the house, exercising, so on and so forth. Um, You can utilize these podcasts to help you Uh, prepare and pass your exams. Uh, With that said, uh, you can track me down, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCPS, BCGP. Uh, Leave a kind rating review on Amazon or wherever else you're listening. Uh, And uh, I am going to sign off for today. I thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a great rest of your day.